In this series of videos, specifically prokaryotic cell structure and function, which you may not have gone into such detail necessarily in your standard biology courses. So what is the difference between a prokaryote and a eukaryote? So one of the major differences is the way that they package their DNA. A prokaryote is uh, an organism that has no nucleus, and its DNA is not wrapped around histones. A histone is a sort of stabilizing protein for the package of a pro uh, um of DNA in a eukaryote. Uh, prokaryotes have what we call our histone-like proteins. They're a little bit different. Now it's important to recognize that one of the things that we consciously try and do when we're dealing with prokaryotes is we try to identify differences because those differences are potential drug targets. We look for things that we can target that are different from ourselves. So the fact that their histones are a little bit different than ours is a potential drug target. They also have a cell wall, and the makeup of their cell wall is different than that of eukaryotic cell walls. In particular, bacteria have a, a polysaccharide called peptidoglycan that makes up their cell wall, as opposed to eukaryotic cell walls in plants that have cellulose. Archaea, which are also considered prokaryotes, remember that these are two of the separate domains of life. The three domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. So bacteria, or archaea, uh, have tough outer cell walls that are made of other chemicals that are distinct to them. When I talk about archaea in this class, typically it's going to be general. And the reason is, is because we don't know a lot about archaea. At this point, we're still just trying to perfect the method of uh, growing archaea in a lab. A lot of what we know about them is genetic, but we haven't been able to just to study a lot about them in the lab because we haven't been able to culture them very easily. There's also no um, different internal structures in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. They're very simple. They have no membrane-bound organelles. So the three different parts that I'm going to talk in this series of videos is external parts, the cell envelope, and the internal parts of a prokaryotic cell. The external parts is what I'm going to cover in this lecture. So that deals with appendages and something called the glycocalyx. So structures that are common to all bacterial cells. So every single bacterial cell has a cell membrane. They have cytoplasm, they have ribosomes, and they have one or very some have a few chromosomes. Uh, structures that are found in most bacterial cells, but not all, are a cell wall and the surface coating, also known as a glycocalyx, which I'll go into detail about. Uh, structural um, components that are found in some bacterial cells, so not every single type of bacteria has these, but we'll do, do an overview, are flagella, pili, fimbriae, capsules, slime layers, inclusion bodies, actin cytoskeletons, and endospores. So this image right here, which it looks a little bit different in your textbook, but it gives an overview of all the parts. So I like to conclude these in the slide. This is sort of a, an image of a prokaryotic cell that contains every single component. And again, not all bacteria have every single component. But this is a good slide to come back after we go through the lecture for you to review and visualize all the different parts. And again, in this video, I'll just be discussing the um, external appendages in detail individually. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the flagella. So a flagella is um, a is used for locomotion, so to move around, and there are three parts to a flagella. There's the filament, which is sort of like the tail-like part uh, that you think of, and then there's a hook, and there is the basal body. So if you look here, this is actually the membrane and the cell wall of the bacteria. So this is made up completely of protein, and it can only rotate uh, fluidly in one direction. So the basal body is wh where it sort of like is secured into the membrane. The hook is just the turn, and then here's like the whip of the tail. So it'll turn around and it will cause it to, to move in a specific direction. <laughs> 
Now, there's several different kinds of flagella arrangements that bacteria are known to have. A monotrichous flagella is one where you just have one single flagella. So this is an image of a bacterium that has a, uh, a monotrichous flagella. A lophotrichous is when you see small bunches or tufts in one area. So here is an example of a lophotrichous. And then peritrichus is when they're dispersed randomly over the surface. So here is peritrichus. Uh, this is, I think it's called ditrichus, but that we're not, I'm not really too concerned about this. This isn't as common. So just remember these three terms and these three flagellar arrangements. So how flagella function is really interesting. So in order for the flagella to function, it has to be responding to some sort of chemical or physical stimulus. So the movement of an organism towards or away from a stimulus, a chemical stimulus, is called chemotaxis. So it senses something in its environment and therefore it can move towards or away from it. And like sensing that chemical causes the flagella to function. Uh, phototaxis is an interesting example where there are some bacteria that can actually respond or have their flagella respond to light. Now remember that they have that basal body that sort of bridges the gap from being an internal structure to communicating with the internal of the cell. Uh, there's also some bacteria that do something really cool called magnetotaxis, and magnetotaxis is when they respond to a magnetic field. So that's very interesting as well. They can do all sorts of uh, interesting things. However, the fl flagella doesn't function. Uh, it's not super efficient, I guess we would say. So it moves by a system of runs and tumbles. So essentially what happens is that the flagella sort of winds itself up, and as it winds itself up, it releases like a rubber band, sort of. And as it's releasing like a rubber band, it runs. So it runs in a uh, specific direction, so in one single line. Then it needs to rewind itself. So as it's rewinding itself, the bacteria sort of tumbles and then randomly orients itself in a different direction. And then it'll start to release and it'll run. And then it'll tumble and then it'll run and then it'll tumble. So how does this actually work? How does something move from one direction to another when it's, when it's sort of stumbling and randomly moving, you know, randomly tumbling at these points? When it senses a gradient, it will either lengthen or shorten the runs based on whether or not it's moving towards or away from the gradient. So if it's pointed in the right direction, it lengthens the runs. If it's pointed in the wrong direction, like here to here, then it shortens the runs. So eventually it gets where it's going, but it doesn't just swim in one direction in one path. So it's sort of an interesting biological ad adaptation, how a flagella or how an organism can move in one specific direction without having any sort of like thought processes and just responding to a, a chemical stimulant. Now some organisms, specifically spirochetes, which are spiral shaped bacteria, instead of having like a, a tail, like a flagella, they have something called axial filaments. And this is essentially a fl flagella that runs down the sides of its body. So this is a cross section of the bacteria and you can see these are the filaments. This is looking at it from this side. And so it's like a corkscrew. The whole body is a corkscrew and it can corkscrew through um, uh, through a media, just like uh, the flagella does, but it works in like as a sort of whole body flagella. Now, pili are um, essentially like sex organs. They're long tubular rigid protein structures. They're made of a protein called pilin, which is why they're called pili. And essentially they're long tubes that are found in gram-negative bacteria. And we'll discuss what gram-negative means. For right now, don't worry about that. It's just a specific groups of type of bacteria. It's not found in all bacteria. Um, but it's important to note that gram-negative bacteria are typically pathogenic, or pathogens are typically gram-negative. Um, which will be important later to think about. 
So they do this thing called conjugation. And conjugation is a way for adjacent bacteria to exchange genetic information. So ge like genetic information will go, so DNA will go from one bacteria to another. So they can convey things like resistance to one another. And it's the closest thing that we have to like bacterial sex, right? They're unicellular organs, they're asexual, but they're exchanging genetic information. So a pili is how they do this and conjugation is the process of this happening. Fimbriae are also proteins um, and they're basically like little hair like structures and I just think of them as like bristles or teeth and they allow a bacteria to adhere to a surface. This is an actual picture of um, E. coli bacteria in the intestinal wall. So E. coli are very important for our digestion and they reside in our intestine. But of course, you know, it's our intestine so things are constantly flowing through it. So why are they not washed away? The reason is, is because they have these bristles that allow them to attach to the intestinal wall. So a lot of times people get pili and fimbriae mixed up because they're both like external protein spike-like appendages. But the function of a pili is to exchange genetic information. The, pu the function of a fimbriae is just to grab on. I mentioned glycocalyx in the chemistry lecture, and remember that glycocalyx is a, a polysaccharide, so it's a complex polysaccharide. Um, it does also sometimes contain some proteins, and its function is to protect the cell. So it can um, provide external protection, avoid water from going in and out, or it can also help to um, adhere to a surface as well by creating sort of like a sticky, slimy layer. So there's two different types of glycocalyx. There's the slime layer and there's the capsule. The slime layer is typically more for protection and uh, gripping onto a surface. Where uh, and to hold in nutrients to prevent loss of water, it's sort of like this fatty little wax on the outside that keeps things from going in and out. The capsule, however, is more of like a thick, thick, rigid structure. It's denser. It makes it more difficult for things to go in and out as well. But it's less. The slime layer is like a gooey mix. Okay, whereas the capsule is more like what it says. It's like it's a an external coating. It's thicker. Okay, so the function of the glycocalyx, like I said, was to um, prevent loss of water and nutrients, to adhere to things for protection, but it can also be very important in pathogenic bacteria because the um, a human immune system essentially wants to identify foreign organisms and engulf them and digest them, right? So this right here is a phagocyte, a macrophage. It's a human immune cell and it's trying to eat this nasty little bacteria that's in the body and digest it and sort of get it out, right? So the glycocalyx can help prevent that by sort of masking itself, sticking itself together, preventing the macrophage from being able to engulf it. Now, when bacteria come together in a giant slime, they form these things called biofilms, which helps them to sort of live in a colony and also protect themselves. They can also create toxins in these biofilms that make them sort of dangerous. Um, but a good example is if you've ever, you, you know, your shower gets slimy, you know, you haven't washed in a while and it gets sort of like this slimy feeling to it, that's a colony of bacteria that are sort of living in your shower that are producing a slime layer and trying to keep it from washing down with all the you know, the fresh water. So that pretty much covers sort of external features. In the next uh, lecture video, I'm going to talk about the cell wall envelope and the cell membrane, and then in the next video after that, I'll talk about internal structures.